welcome to Don't Shout at the Detelli with me, your host, Emily Bowen. This is the first episode of our new science series supported by the Wellcome Trust. Today we'll be discussing pain and animal experimentation, and we're delighted to have with us Dr. Stuart Derbyshire, who's the Director of Pain Imaging at the University of Birmingham and a reader in psychology. Stuart, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. So part of what I want to do today is get you to start thinking about sensation and action in a different kind of way. So typically you think that sensation just follows a stimulus. If I stick a pin in your hand, it'll hurt because I stuck a pin in your hand. And if you move your hand away, you're moving your hand away because you want to move your hand away. So what you feel is a reflection of what's out there in the world, and what you do is a reflection of what you want to do. That's a sort of commonsensical way of thinking about sensation and behaviour. I want to just wobble your commitment to that commonsensical view a little bit at the beginning. And what, how I'm going to do that is with three different experiments. The first one, everybody can take part in. I'm going to do a slight Darren Brown impression. Don't worry, I'm not actually going to hypnotise you, uh, but I am going to relax you and get to do something quite interesting. So to start off with, what I want you to do is just tense yourself up as much as you can. Tense yourself up. Get yourself really, really tense. And now I want you to just relax and close your eyes. And just relax. And let all that tension just... Just let it fade away. Let that tension roll out of your body. Okay, get yourself nice and relaxed and breathing nice and steadily. Happily relax. And now what I want you to do is want you to put your hands out in front of you, straight out in front of you. And I want you to keep your eyes closed with your hands out in front of you. Stay nice and relaxed. And just turn your palms in towards, the, towards each other. Palms facing each other. And hold your hands about 30 centimetres apart. So palms facing each other, hands about 30 centimetres apart. And I want you to concentrate on your hands because something, hopefully, very interesting is going to happen to them. I want you to think about your hands having very, very powerful magnets connected to each hand. And those magnets are pulling your hands on together. And as you concentrate on the magnets on your hands, you'll feel your hands moving closer and closer, being pulled together. As the magnets grab hold of your hands, they're pulling, 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 moving your hands closer and closer together. Really feel those magnets pulling your hands closer and closer, moving your hands closer and closer together, pulling, 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 closer, 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 and stop. Okay, you can close, open your eyes and just relax again. Now, some of you did not move at all, but some of you round here moved a little bit. And some of you actually got your hands nice and close. And as Marissa, you got your hands together. Now, how did, how did it feel? As your hands were coming together, did it feel like you were doing it? Or did it feel like they were being pulled? Well, I was doing it. Felt like you were doing it. Yeah. Okay, how about you two? You was, your hands were coming together. You felt, like, pulling. you felt like it was being pulled. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I felt like it was being pulled. So that's, that's a fairly typical response. Some people don't respond at all. Some people do what you do, it's like they push them together themselves. And then some people have this strange sensation of their hands kind of being pulled against their will. Now, of course, obviously, here's you that's doing it, but you don't feel that it's you that's doing it. So again, I want you to think about it as a slight wobble there in your normal association between your intention and your behaviour. So behaviour doesn't always reflect faithfully what it is um, that's happening. Okay, so this next experiment, I'm going to use these pendulums that are sat in front of the, on the table there. And I just want the people nearest to me um, to grab our pendulum. And what I want you to do, um, if there's any left, then, then we can, other people can grab hold of them too. There's one left, so I want you to go for it. Go on, get it, go, grab it. <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do is just hold it out in front of you, like that. Uh, try not to knock anything down as you're doing this. Okay, don't worry about the dangly bit. And what I want you to do is I want you to stare intently at the pendulum. Okay, hold it dead straight and make sure it's not wobbling at all. Uh, keep it nice and nice and still. And then as before, um, I want you to concentrate on this pendulum because something rather interesting is going to start to happen. I want you to imagine that there's a wind blowing in this room and that wind is blowing hard um, across your face and it's blowing slightly to the left and then slightly to the right and then slightly to the left and then slightly to the right and as the wind blows you start to feel and see the pendulum rock tick tock 
tick, tock, tick, tock, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. And the wind's getting stronger and stronger and blowing harder and harder, tick, tock, tick, tock, pushing the pendulum left and right, faster and faster, larger and larger swings. And now I want you to imagine that the wind is changing direction. It's not blowing across your face now, but it's blowing into your face. And as it blows into your face, the pendulum starts to slow, and now it starts to swing backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, towards you and away from you, towards you and away from you, towards you, away, towards, away, backwards and forwards, faster and faster. And now I want to imagine that this, the, um, the wind is dying down, it's dying down, and the pendulum is slowing, 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 and stop. Excellent. That works extremely well. Okay, you can put your pendulums down. So again, it's the same kind of principle as with the um, hand moving. Um, obviously, it's you that's moving the pendulum. But does it feel like it's you that's moving the pendulum? Does it feel you that time? No. Not so much that time? How about you two? Um, I don't know, I don't really feel it moving at all. So. Okay, you know, it wasn't wobbling yeah, too much. But you did, it did move, I saw it move, definitely. And you? you yeah, I tried to hold it still, but... I hold no. it still? Excellent, <laughs> excellent. So is it, what this demonstrates is that a number of... One is that when you think about doing something, there's a tendency to carry out that action. But even though you have no intention of carrying out that action, you still actually do it. Um, it's obviously not magic that's making the pendulum swing. It is you that's making the pendulum swing. But you don't feel like it's you um, that's doing it. So again, I want to think about that little wobble um, between your intention and what's actually happening. Okay, so this next experiment, um, I actually need to swap spaces with um, Jessica and use my magic hand to do that. I'll step here and let you go through first. Alright. Okay, so Bob, if you can just put your arm here. Okay, lean in a bit so you're nice and comfortable, you don't have to be uncomfortable. Alright, let's just move this slightly uh, over here, a bit of a gap. Okay, can you do your trick with the, with the sheet? So the idea is to cover the distance between Bob and the arm, so you can fold it down a bit more actually. Okay, if you just could concentrate on this hand and try and ignore your hand as much as possible. Pay close attention to the rubber hand and just let me know if anything unexpected or interesting starts to happen. Oh, yeah, no, I can. Excellent. Okay. okay. It actually is starting to feel like my hand, the rubber hand. Excellent. Excellent. And can you just describe that sensation for everybody? Because nobody's going to believe you. It sounds like you're talking utter gibberish. Well, that, no, that, that is actually weird. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so could you, could you describe the weird? Well, it just basically feels like the rubber hand is my hand. I'm, because I'm just concentrating on the rubber hand, it just feels like... But when you say it, it feels like... I mean, what would you mean? It's clearly not your hand. No. So, so what, what does it feel like? It, I can just feel the paintbrush, it's like, it does, I can feel the paintbrush and, I'm, and the hand, I'm looking at the hand and it just, it, yeah, it's just like the rubber hand is, is my hand and I'm feeling basically the paintbrush. So you're feeling the brushes that I'm doing on your hand yeah. as, if, as if they're coming from that rubber hand. Yeah. But that rubber hand has no sensory nerve fibres in it, is in no way connected to your body. No. That's madness, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what if I was to suggest that I get a hammer and smash it into that rubber hand? Um, how would you feel about that? Yeah, I'd say I'd feel comfortable because I know it's not my hand. I you, do. You, you're comfortable with that. You should. <gasps> <laughs> Sometimes you go. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was weird, though. Did you get any anxiety? Though, did that? No, but no. that that did feel weird. Okay, let's just have a little bit more stroke. You know, it's just, just for more weirdness. Has it come back yet? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Very quick. Once you once it starts the second time, it works really well. Okay, so just one more time for our audience. What, what are you feeling? I'm just basically feeling the paintbrush um, on the rubber hand as if it was my hand, so I can feel the the paintbrush. 
Okay. And are you feeling your as if your hand has become sort of rubbery? Um, yeah, slightly, yeah. Yeah. And when I do that, does that, does that feel rather odd? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because your hand doesn't move like that. And that's a bit weird. And sometimes people also report they feel as though they're getting their hands are getting freckles on them where the where the rubber hand is or anything like that. No. No. Okay. Don't want to push my luck, you know. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. That's excellent. Okay, so Jessica, shall we swap back? Okay, you can you can sit back now. You don't have to continue with the right hand. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's fine. Okay, so what those three experiments show is that what you feel and what you experience isn't necessarily tied to the objective world in the way in which you might think it is. It wasn't Bob's hand, yet Bob felt that that was his hand and felt the stroke coming from it. And so I'm going to explore those ideas in a little bit more detail and try and use that to explain why human experience is somewhat different from animal experience. And in fact, I'm going to cast aspersions that animals cannot experience at all. I think there are lots of really good reasons to ask the question of what can animals feel, can they feel pain, can they suffer, um, because it tests what we know about pain, and because of course it can inform how we do certain things, like pest control, the use of slaughterhouses, animal experimentation, and so forth. But before I go on to that, I want to get out of the way just one really bad reason to ask the question whether or not animals can feel pain, and that is to justify acts of wanton destruction towards animals. So I'm not arguing um, that the fact that animals don't feel means we can go out and kick the neighbourhood cat or set fire to the neighbourhood dog. I think those acts would be wrong, not necessarily because of what they do to the animal, but because of what they do to us. It's a dehumanised, base thing to do. I don't say that we should smash windows, burn down trees, uh, mess up factories, pollute rivers. I don't think these things feel pain, I don't think they have any sentience at all, but I don't want to see acts of wanton destruction taking place in the world. So I'm not here to justify that kind of behaviour. But as I say, asking the question of what animals feel um, can inform how we run slaughterhouses, how we control pests, and whether or not we can and should do um, animal experimentation. And it's that last one I'm going to concentrate most on here is the most contentious out of the three, even though an awful lot more animals die at the hands of pest control and at the hands of slaughterhouses than do at um, the hands of experimenters. But nevertheless, experimentation is um, the more contentious of those three. UK legislation um, on animal research is based around the idea that we should refine, reduce and replace animals as much as we possibly can in experiments. These are the so-called three R's, and I know the Wellcome Trust supports the three R's, most um, experimental bodies support the three R's, the three R's are very, very um, popular. I have a number of problems with the three R's. I think my first problem is I think they're, they're somewhat patronising. You know, the idea that we should refine and reduce the number of animals that we use in experimentation, no scientist would argue with. Of course you should do your experiment in the best possible manner, and of course you should use the smallest number of animals that you can. You wouldn't want to use more animals than you need to, and you would want to use more test tubes than you need to. And you wouldn't want to run an experiment that didn't answer your question whether you're using animals or not. So telling experimenters to refine and reduce is somewhat patronising. We know to refine and reduce. That's okay, I don't mind being patronised, but I think there's another problem, and it's this uh, dishonesty that sneaks in. Is that replacement is, I think, pretty much impractical and impossible. If we want to do medical research, if we want to understand the natural world, then we have to experiment on animals. And if you really want to get rid of animal experimentation, then you have to do it on a moral basis. You have to basically argue that it's wrong to do it. And if it's wrong to do it, then it's wrong to do it. And we shouldn't do it. End of. It's not a choice between cages that have got lots of toys in and cages that are empty. It is basically an empty cage you want if you think animal research is wrong. And I think the three R's distract us from having that kind of more um, difficult uh, argument. So should we stop animal research? Well, the biggest argument that we should stop animal research is because animals can and will suffer. Even if you anaesthetise, even if you carry out all kinds of procedures to reduce the level of pain, it's obvious that the animal experimentation harms animals. Um, they lose their lives, um, they lose their ability to do some of the things they normally do, they lose their freedom and so on and so forth. So do those arguments make any kind of sense um, when it comes to um, animals? So you can boil that down to a fairly simple question, which is what, what, what is it like to be an animal? You know, what would it be like to feel as an animal? What does that mean? And we can focus on a number of different things to try and answer that question. We obviously can't ask the animals because they can't talk to us. 
um, but we can study what they do, and that's one approach that scientists have used. I don't think studying what animals do works, then I'll explain why. So if um, you were to see a locust chomping away on a plant, and you might notice that the locust itself has been eaten by another locust as it is eating, you might draw the conclusion the locust doesn't feel pain, because that seems pretty bizarre to carry on eating while you have been eating if um, you experience pain. So then that sense of behaviour seems to work. But then let me introduce the fruit fly larvae, maggots to you and I. A fruit fly larvae will bend and roll away when you light a flame next to it, which is, looks like a purposive behaviour, looks like a behaviour to avoid um, a painful experience. But most of us reject the idea that fruit fly larvae, a maggot, can feel pain. Why? Because the maggot doesn't have much of a brain, it doesn't really have a nervous system to speak of, it has more of a neural net. Um, and that doesn't feel like enough um, to experience something as complex as a pain. Um, so we rule out pain for fruit fly larvae, and if we're going to rule out pain for the fruit fly larvae, then we're kind of saying behaviour doesn't really work because it doesn't necessarily reflect what has been um, experienced. But we've used neuroscience in that particular example. So then that raises the possibility, well, maybe we can use neuroscience. We can ask what is a necessary and sufficient nervous system to experience pain. And that's been attempted many times. I think that also fails. That fails for lots of reasons, but to put it very, very bluntly, it fails because we don't have a clue what is a necessary and sufficient nervous system to experience pain. So just to give you one tiny example, there are neurons called vonicomo neurons. I don't know much about them. You don't need to know anything about them at all. All you do need to know is that human beings have this type of neuron. All other animals do not. So does that difference mean that we can experience and they can't? That seems a pretty harsh um, conclusion to draw um, and we've got no real basis for drawing that conclusion because we don't really know what these neurons do. We don't really know how the neural activity, the chemical activity inside a neuron translates um, into experience. So neuroscience becomes a dead end um, as well. So I don't think behaviour works, I don't think neuroscience works, so what does work? I think the only way we can answer the question of whether or not an animal or anything feels pain is to examine the mental contents of pain and the mental psychological structure of the creature that we're supposing can feel this experience. So what do I mean by mental? Well, I think mental is not brain. Um, it, may, it needs a brain, the brain is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So mental involves things like reasoning, things like language, things like memory, those kinds of things, the bric-a-brac that makes up your psychological life, your psychological self. And what I'm going to argue is that that is absolutely critical to everything. Um, it's not that pain is something that exists sort of independently from that psychological self. It's pain is experienced through that psychological self. And if you don't have it, then you don't have pain and you don't have anything else either. I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. As it happens, Descartes, over 400 years ago, made the notorious argument that we can treat animals as machines, but human beings you can't treat as machines because we have reason and language and these things that make us separate from the machine um, world. Descartes gets a lot of stick for that idea, but I think he was clearly onto something. And the way in which he came to this conclusion is that he did a very ingenious experiment. He grabbed an ox eye, he scratched out all the gobbins at the back of the eye, he held the eye up to his eye, and he looked through it, looked through the lens of the ox eye, out at the world. And what he saw surprised him. Because what he saw was the world upside down. And what he realised was that the, the lens of the eye projects an image of the world that is inverted. Your eye is projecting an image of the world that is upside down all the time. But you don't see an upside down world. You see the world the right way up. And so Descartes drew the conclusion that what we're seeing and what we're experiencing is not a direct reflection of our sensory apparatus and the world out there. There's some sort of interpretation going on. There's some sort of faculty of mind that's been applied here, that's turning the world um, the right way up. And what Descartes argued was that we're not drowned or dazzled in sensation. We are self-located within it. So if you look um, at a red couch, you don't become full of red, you don't become just red, you become you looking at a red couch. All the time you're interpreting, all the time you're reasoning, thinking, and that's what you're experiencing the world um, through. So if you start to think of pain as being the same kind of stuff as all of this, you know, pain has a certain content, it's located in a certain part of your body, has a certain feel to it, it's 
um, it's stabbing, it's um, throbbing, or whatever, has a certain um, emotional content to it, it's irritating or terrifying, depending on precisely what's going on, and it's always you that's reflecting and thinking and interpreting what it is that's going on. It's not static, it's not just given, um, it's part of your psychology, it's a part of your um, self-reflection. Um, I don't think animals can do that. I think that's asking too much of an animal to think that when it gets its paw stuck in a trap or whatever, it's reflecting on, oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to run as fast as I could now, you know, nobody's going to want to marry me now that I've lost a leg, um, I wish I hadn't gone down this particular route, god damn, that, that, that throbbing, jeez, was somebody please switch the trap off? I don't think dogs are doing that, because that would give dogs wall-to-wall -wall minds, the same kinds of minds that we have, and then we wouldn't have to worry about whether it's right or wrong to experiment on dogs because they'd tell us in some way that this was not something that they could accept and they ought to pack it in. Dogs don't do that. So I don't think dogs have that kind of mind. So what I'm kind of saying is that pain isn't just this, as I say, this tag on to, to knowledge and self and experience. It is a part of knowledge. It is a part of um, self-experience. And so we can deny it to animals on that basis. Now that is, I accept, a pretty harsh um, conclusion. And there does seem to be some wiggle room between saying, well, okay, maybe the way in which we experience pain involves you know, this complicated, complex, knowledge-based stuff. But maybe animals just experience pain in a raw, more immediate form. We can draw a distinction between knowing that you're in pain as a second order of thought and being able to report it to others and just being in pain as a first order thought, something that you can't reflect on, you can't report to others, but it just is as a bald fact. And the, the truth of its existence just merely is in that moment, and it has no wider boundary, it doesn't expand into anything else, it just is. The dog is full of pain um, when it has its um, paw stuck in the trap. Now that sounds like an idea that can work, but I'm going to cast aspersions on whether or not that idea can work as well and then I'm going to finish on that point. So the reason why I don't think this idea works is because all the time there is um, sensation um, impinging on you. All the time um, your sensory apparatus is firing away. So right now um, it's quite warm in this room, you're probably feeling the heat from the lights, um, you might be um, feeling your backside against the couch, um, there's a bit of noise outside that might, you might be able to hear, uh, there's a hum of the cameras and so on and so forth. But hopefully uh, actually, none of that was in your awareness um, until I brought it up, um, because you were all listening to my words of wisdom um, intently and contently, and all of that was gone. But, as it happens, all the time, sensory receptors are exploding all over you. And every time you move, every time you breathe, every time you do anything, a whole host of new sensory receptors explode into life um, as well. And if you were experiencing everything as an immediacy, then you would be constantly fleeting from one experience to another. Um, you'd have this tumble of experience um, because you'd be experiencing everything at once in a totality. And I think that therefore means you'd be experiencing nothing because we cannot experience a totality. We can only experience a singularity, a discriminate. Consciousness can't experience everything at once. It has to discriminate out what it is it's going to experience. And it's only self-located beings that can do that discrimination. And that, I think, was what Descartes' point was. It's we who extract um, what it is we want to experience. So there's a twofold um, notion to experience. It's not just the objective world impinging on you, it's also you looking out at the world and sorting it up and selecting out what it is you're going to experience. Okay, so just to conclude, what I'm arguing is that animals don't experience. And that changes basically the whole question of how we treat animals. It's no longer a question of worrying about what the animal feels. It's now a question of worrying about what kind of world we want to live in. Um, how we use animals becomes dictated by what it is we're trying to achieve rather than worrying about what it is that animals feel. So would you say animals don't feel pain or they just don't experience it? So... I'm not sure I understand the distinction really, so I mean, if, I guess I'd ask you to unpack it a little bit, but if you, you know, just bluntly, uh, I'd say feeling is a part of experience. Uh, in order to feel it, I have to know that it's there in that particular location, it has that particular feel to it. And so that, that is what experience is. Well, if you kick a dog, yeah. it'll make a noise, and you sure. and we would interpret that as, oh, it, it's been heard. Yeah. Would you say it doesn't have a feel, like it doesn't have a pain, or do yeah. you think it's just different? It doesn't think like, oh, 
Don't hurt me out. Yeah, so, so what you're getting at there is that distinction. I think it feels like it can work. You know, the, the, this, okay, the dog isn't like going, oh, you pack that in and, you know, like, oh, my back and I'm not going to be able to do much today because of that. Thanks very much. I mean, that's, that's too much. That's a wall to wall mind experience that we probably all agree animals can't do. But there's that notion that, that there's something the animal experience is akin to what you experience. And what I'm arguing is that you can't do that. You can't extract pain as a sort of fully formed psychological entity from um, the psychological self that experiences. So it's not like pain exists independent of your typical psychological self. Pain is experienced through and because of your typical psychological self. And because the dog doesn't have a psychological self, he doesn't have um, an experience of pain. Okay. But the thing is, if you pull the dog's tail, it will bite your hand. It won't just you know, feel pain and just you know, walk off. It will find a way of trying to stop that pain. Yeah. So I'm not saying that animals behave randomly. Um, I mean, that, that would be ridiculous, right? Um, it's obvious that animals have been formed and uh, uh, developed adaptations in response to evolutionary pressure. So a dog um, that got its tail trapped and didn't pull away from it would quickly go extinct um, because you know, dogs can survive better if they behave in that kind of way. In the same way that the fruit fly larvae survives better because when it's got a lit flame next to it, it bends and it rolls away. But we don't think that the larvae feels pain. There's no particular reason, I'm arguing, for us to think that the dog does either. What we can argue is that it has a set of adapted behaviours to a certain set of circumstances that mean that the dog will, will survive better in the future. But that isn't the same as pain. So can I ask what are the indications that it's getting that it needs to adapt? Um, like for people who can't feel pain, yeah. um, they have huge problems because they don't know what to do when they, like for example, they don't realise their hands on fire, they don't realise that what is it in the dog that's making it realise it needs to... Yeah, so, so, so let's again just unpack that a little bit. So a, there are groups of people of congenital insensitivity to pain. And these people do not live very long. Um, they uh, do inflict horrible injuries on themselves. So famously a woman um, had a very, very hot casserole in the oven and unthinkingly she, she just pulled it out with her bare hands, put it on the table and the table erupted in flames uh, to a rather horrified family sitting in front of her. Um, so those people don't live long and the, reason, the main reason they don't live long actually interestingly isn't because of those kinds of experiences, it's because when you're standing up, unbeknown to you, you're doing little shifts all the time and those little shifts are protect, protecting the joints in your body and they are enforced upon you by an experience of pain, but it's not an experience you're particularly conscious aware of. Um, a person with congenital sensitivity to pain doesn't engage in those, those little shifts, and what happens is the joints um, start to get damaged, there gets a buildup of blood in the joints, that blood gets trapped, it goes rotten, it is then released, and they get poisoned essentially, and that's what um, typically kills people with congenital sensitivity to pain. So it's this, what I'm saying is the dog is behaving in the same way that you are when you're stood up. You make those little movements completely unconsciously, uh, completely not volitionally, uh, completely unbeknown to you in order to protect your joints. And the dog will move away from something that's um, threatening for exactly the same reason. But it doesn't need to be, uh, have any experience of it. So it doesn't need to be a negative thing. It can just be an adjustment. It just is. Yeah, it's just a behaviour. Yeah. Um, another point. You were speaking about how humans, they, already, they have some sort of innate understanding of it. And when you were talking about Descartes, he was a rationalist, and if would you hold the view that humans do have the innate idea of pain? However, animals they just send, they just experience it. They're more on the empiricism side, so they can't experience pain. Yeah, but, so I, th I think you know, just again, I just a little wobble in there. I think so. So they can't argue that we can we can experience we can treat people as both machines and rational beings. You know, so, and it's at one level quite reasonable to treat people as machines. If I stick a pin in you and there's a, an automatic nervous reaction, uh, nerve fibres will fire, pass information to the spinal cord, pass information to the brain. But what Descartes argued is that you can't get from a machine to experience. Um, there, there has to be some interjection of rationality, thought, reason, language, all that kind of good stuff. Now, where does that come from? Well, Descartes argued that that came from God, a bit of a problem. Um, we rejected God from 21st century science. Um, but with that, we rejected, I think, the active Cartesian subject that Descartes gave to us, which is that human awareness isn't just born directly from the mechanics of the body, but is born from our um, inculcation into human society, if you like. It's through culture, it's through development um, that we get um, experience. And so I, I've lost sight of your original question, um, but I argue that animals don't 
have that um, passage, not just because um, you know we don't try and do it, because even if you do try and do it, they're not equipped to be able to deal with it. Isn't that the problem though we have in like society, in, in that we're not able to argue convincingly for animal experimentation because we don't see ourselves as Descartes saw humanity as sort of with culture and all that baggage outside of the body. We are now increasingly seeing ourselves in evolutionary terms, your behavioural economics and what have you, and you know the idea that we are our brain, yeah. rather than everything, all that knowledge that the society has. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think that is one of the reasons why it's become much more difficult to argue for animal experimentation because culturally we do now think of ourselves as just another animal. We're not really that special. In fact, we might even be a little bit less nice than most animals. You know, we do all the destructive things, we do all the bad things, and there's that honing in of humanity, um, which unfortunately means that we can't make such a strong case for animal research. After all, animal research is about the betterment of human beings, but why would we want to do that? Look what we've done to the planet, look what we've done to each other. You know, that, that kind of argument undermines um, our ability to, to make a strong case for animal research. I think you're right. Yeah. That's problematic, because, I mean, humanity, we, we created all this, society, cities, all this. So it's, it's problematic to see ourselves as just another animal, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's, it's a lack of uh, faith on ourselves as well. Yes, I agree with that. So, you know, people often say that we're quite similar to chimpanzees, but as it happens, when you look at how chimpanzees live today, it's almost identical to how chimpanzees lived 50,000 years ago. Yet, if you look at how we live today, it's, it's dramatically different from how we lived 50,000 years ago. So, yes, I agree. The, the argument is somewhat insane um, that we are not um, different from the, all the other animals and that we're not, you know, we're not just another ape. Oh, sorry, you know, I just thought, um, I understand the value of um, animal research and I think it should be done. But I think just because we can probably argue that animals don't have pain doesn't mean that they can't suffer. Because if you put um, orangutan um, in solitary, sort of, you know, in a little cell, they do start to change their behaviour and we would probably interpret it as they're lonely. They start, I don't know pulling up the hair or something, they, they start being depressed, as we might think. So they might suffer if we take them out of their social context, not because we inflict pain upon them, but they suffer. So is there a way that we can do animal research and, you know, as much as we need to do it to get good results, but also to minimise the, I don't know, social suffering okay. upon them? Yeah, so you said a lot of different things there, so I don't to try and unpack it. So it's, it's interesting straight away that you have to put depression in inverted commas, because you say, well, you know, obviously animals can't get depressed, because that's a human thing, right? So, you know, and all these little wiggles that we do all the time, because we can't quite find the words that properly explain what's going on. And what I'd argue is the reason we can't quite find the words to properly explain what's going on is because what we interpret, which is what you said, is not actually what is going on. So it's not that a dog in solitary confinement is thinking, oh, you know, I really used to love going for my walks down, down to Hackney Central and I miss that bakery on the corner and, you know, it was, it was great and where are my friends? And, you know, they're not thinking like that. It's just that it is adaptively bad uh, for a dog to be in social isolation and the way in which in, historically dogs have escaped that is by showing a sad face and, and you know, whatever, you know, the, the dogs do under those particular circumstances. Human beings tend to release them under those, when they do those kinds of behaviours and so they become useful. The more increasingly maladaptive behaviours are, are more difficult to account for in an adaptive sense. Um, but then um, what you're really talking about then is something that's gone so far beyond what historically has happened that all bets are off. Behaviour is now just becoming random, you know, nothing clearly obvious as is happening under those circumstances. We're always trying to put into human terms what the animal is doing, but that's, a, I think, a category error, that's a mistake. It's not a human being, so it's not thinking and feeling in the way that you are. So I, in the same way I can deny pain, I also deny suffering. Suffering requires an understanding of a situation that you're in, requires language, thought, logic, reason, and all the rest of it that we bring to bear. Again, you don't suffer independently of your psychological self. You suffer because of your psychological self. And if you don't have that, then you don't have suffering. So we basically have to accept that we are superior, which... Well, I, I, don't, I guess... We have conscious and innocent, then. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by superior. I mean, I, I think we can accept that for all kinds of different reasons, but I mean, I wouldn't... I don't think I'd quite put it in that, that kind of way. I think we accept that we have something that they don't, and that there's this um, conscious experience um, that isn't happening um, anywhere else in the natural world. We are 
utterly freakish and weird and being able to reflect and experience what is happening to us. The idea that humans have a higher moral status than apes, for example, um, raises the question of whether we then have a higher moral responsibility to look after them, um, which then further raises the point that someone would then have to make that decision to put those apes' rights, or I say rights, um, before humans who are then could be suffering because this experimentation hasn't come forward. So it raises a lot of points. I'm not entirely sure how to balance them. So I would say in response to that, what we do with animals is reflecting on, yeah, like you said, it reflects on us, but it's also we're using them for, we're not just, as Stuart said at the beginning, about just destroying them and you know, eradicating them sort of for no reason whatsoever, we'll be using them in, in, for purposes of research. So there's a moral case, I think that the moral case is, is through that. Yeah, because by, by being distracted on animal welfare, we kind of don't realise how important um, experimentation is to evolution, to, to, to development, so that's... I just wanted to say that so far in the conversation we've been talking about how animal behaviour perhaps is not so similar to human behaviour. But then this is often used as the basis for animal experimentation. Like Many people do say that it's okay to experiment on animals for humans because the behaviour is similar. Why do you think uh, this is the case? And surely if um, the behaviour is not so similar that means the animals just suffering for no apparent reason and then perhaps we couldn't use the moral argument of using animal experimentation as a valid reason for humans uh, to survive further in the world. Um, I just wanted to know how reliable um, results are for animal testing um, in terms of, because obviously humans, human anatomy and animal anatomy are quite different. Um, I just wanted to know how reliable it is, really. Sure, yeah. I don't think you can really um, look at behaviour. I think it's more to do with the genetics of animals rather than, you know, because animal, different animals behave in different ways, you know. With uh, apes or chimpanzees, I think their genetics are more similar to, to um, human beings. I think it's best to use it on animals that have much more similar genetics to us. Okay. But I mean, a lot of questions there. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come back on you guys a bit more, so let's see if you can answer something for me. So, I've made the argument that animals don't experience the world in the same way that they don't experience the world at all, they don't experience, full stop. Do you think that does therefore justify us using animals in an instrumental fashion? And I'd be interested if anybody thinks that that really doesn't matter. Um, you can maybe construct an argument as to why um, that's completely irrelevant. And then uh, this question about our ethical responsibility to animals, I am interested in that too. I mean, what? If you buy my argument, then what is our ethical responsibility to animals? How do we frame that? Um, what do we say about what we can and cannot do um, with animals? Regarding the ethical responsibility, I think the main part of ethics or morality is to have an autonomous person, someone who is able to make their own decisions. And as you said, animals, they don't necessarily have that freedom within themselves and they just react. They have a certain set out sequence of events. So wouldn't that regard them as not included in the morality code that we go by? Hence, we don't have to have any ethical responsibility regarding them. So we're okay with bear baiting, cock fighting, dog non, fights? Non, not necessarily. I'm saying that that could be an argument that's raised. And if you do say that we don't have any ethical responsibility towards them, we, we don't have to kill them as such. But that's more of our morality, us protecting our own kind of like being and seeing in our culture that that's not reasonable. But we don't have to do it. It's not a kind of like a set out um, rule. So. Okay. I think I agree with that. And just to continue to explain what you were saying earlier as well, I think it would be more of a case of to protect humankind. So of course you don't want to go and deforest like deforestation and everything, you don't want to um, sort of kill off species. Maybe not because of a moral stance, but because of it's a, not a sensible idea. Or bear baiting, it's bad maybe for a society, maybe it's bad to be so destructive and so to do such bad acts. Or just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say like, well bear baiting is quite an extreme example, but quite a, a more controversial, I'd say, is bullfighting. 
because there's you, there's an argument for its cultural worth as an art form, you know, something we display something about humanity. Um, but of course, it's also, it can also be argued very cruel against the bull, and there's no real reason. You know, the bull not there; it's not being killed for its meat mm. or experimented on. It's, it's just for art, almost. Yeah, and seeing pictures, um, how some animal rights people sort of show them, like you know, the small monkey with wires for his head or something. That makes me feel guilty. Like I, even though I know it's an animal, I kind of empathise, and it makes me feel bad. So maybe it's we should treat animals with a certain respect just to make to feel good about ourselves in a way because we do it. I think we can't help empathise with a dog that's suffering on the street if if we know. He might not be suffering, he might not feel any pain, but I don't know, the way we experience the world, we probably think he does and makes us feel bad, so maybe for our own sake we should treat him with respect. Just to add to that, if you don't mind me asking, what I believe is we claim or we make accusations that animals don't feel pain, so we don't feel guilty about actually inflicting pain on them. Because at the end of the day, it's how humans feel responsible you see humans have always in my opinion anyway have always wanted to feel comfortable within themselves we even used to enslave other people and uh, within our own kind yet we we couldn't actually see we we wouldn't say oh did we really feel that pain did we just ignore the fact are we being ignorant about the fact that they maybe other people didn't feel pain are we doing the same to what to animals the experimentation is different <coughs> from brutality towards animals Experimentation is like I, we we gain gaining something, we're gaining knowledge uh, sure. of that experiment. And brutality, we just being yeah. But you wouldn't you wouldn't advocate that we did um, ex, you know some of the experiments on humans that we do on animals. I mean you know yeah they're they're for a, a worthy end. But you know I got to tell you, someone looked pretty brutal. You know cutting up a dog and pulling out its spleen and having a look at it. You know dropping electrodes into um, the middle of um, a monkey brain. You know it's not. Not fun, you know. These are pretty ugly um, experiments at times. If if society as a whole didn't believe that animals are feeling pain, then why is it when people take their animals to the vet, they get uh, like anaesthetic put on them, and then then put them asleep? They make sure that they are not feeling that pain. If we didn't think they're feeling that yeah, pain, yeah, I'm making no claim to be talking for society. I recognise oh. that my position is an extreme minority position. Which is actually an interesting point that's being raised there now. It's like, well, nobody believes what I'm saying, yet people do support animal experimentation. Um, so it clearly isn't necessarily our support for animal experimentation is about pain and suffering. Yeah. Um, which again comes back to this point, as it happens, if we don't, if we think animals are similar to us in some sense, then what's the difference between animal research and the history of um, oppression and brutality towards other human beings? I just want to say that I, I don't think that um, animal experimentation is the same as um, slavery or necessarily what went on in Nazi Germany. I think it's completely different. But um, I do think that some of the justification for people doing those things was to dehumanise the people on the other end of the stick. So maybe it's, it's less to do with comparing the two and maybe it's to do with us as humans and the way we see the world and the way we see other people as opposed to um, putting two different, well in my opinion, two different things in the same sort of bracket personally, that's what I think. Can I, I just build on that I think, yeah. that the way that the Nazis and the, saw humanity were built, they sort of extended sort of Darwin's ideas to an extreme where, where they saw different sort of hierarchy within humanity and I'd argue right now we're, we're, we're almost doing, we're doing the same, so all the humans have been brought down to the levels of animals. So we actually can't look at human society through Darwinian sort of you know, way of looking at the world because we've got, we're, the way we experience the world is built on culture, on thousands of years of development, which you just can't apply to animals. Or what if we were to go to a distant tribe where they have never spoken, we don't understand the language, and if we were to shoot them in the leg, and then they reacted, we were just like, oh, that's just a reaction, a sequence of reactions, we don't actually understand what they're saying, so they can't feel pain. Would that apply to the same kind of fact? I think, on the whole, human beings do experience pain pretty much exactly the same. You know, it, there's been many attempts to say that there's certain isolated African tribes that don't experience pain the same way. Very famously, an anthropologist from Britain 
went to, I can't remember exactly which part of Africa it was, and, and he came back and reported that women don't feel pain during childbirth there. And well, oh, that's, that's interesting. And he, this was based on the fact that women would, would give birth and they didn't, they didn't scream, they didn't receive any, any um, anaesthetic, any analgesia, and within a few hours they, they went back to work. You know? And it's like, so, you know, obviously in the West, we're just making it all up. And then an anthropologist about 25 years later went back. And this time, this particular anthropologist spoke Sengali, which was, you know, pretty useful. Um, the previous guy didn't speak a word or local language. And she asked, you know, so what's happening when you give birth? Um, it doesn't look like you're in any pain. And I said, yeah, it hurts like hell. Um, it's just there's no point complaining about it because um, nobody can give you anything. And if I don't go back to work, I'm going to starve. So um, that's, that was what was really um, going on. So I don't buy this idea that there are um, groups of people in the world who don't experience things the same way we do. But how does that happen? Well, I think that happens because there is an interesting connection between objectivity and subjectivity. It clearly is a neural apparatus um, that's necessary for you to experience pain, and most of us have it. It clearly is the case that when that neural apparatus is activated, under most circumstances, it delivers an experience of pain. And that neural apparatus is pretty much the same um, across all um, human beings. You know, it doesn't vary. In fact, it is the same, essentially, and it hardly varies. And that neural apparatus does contain the content of a basic experience of pain, um, that being pain that I talked about earlier. But it's only in human beings that we can find it. In all other creatures, it's hidden. It's there for us to see, but the dog itself, because it doesn't have a subjective self, can't find it amongst the cacophony of all the other things that are going on. And that's an important difference. And our ability to find that experience doesn't come straight out of the nervous system. It comes out of a period of development within human society. Um, the process of development from zero to four, or whatever age you want to pick on, involves an awful lot of delivering mind, reason, language, acculturation, and so forth, which isn't possible in animals. So they never are able to locate that experience, even though we can locate it on their um, behalf. Still wondering about this question about whether or not any of what I'm saying justifies animal experimentation or anything else um, that we do with animals. After all, you know, I could take somebody with Alzheimer's who's apparently lost all ability to um, feel, think, and so forth. But I wouldn't advocate that we experiment on a patient with Alzheimer's. So what's the difference? I think it is different, um, for example, for an Alzheimer's patient because that person has had relationships build up um, and it would affect a, a lot of other people on a very human level. So I think that's, for me, that's where the distinction lies. I can sort of understand why you wouldn't do that to an Alzheimer's patient, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we have to like respect animals and at the end of the day, if you need, you know, human treatments, then you need to either experiment on a human being and, and find out, you know, what, what you, you know, the direct, basically, cause of, of, of what you, you want to find out. I mean, because animals and human beings don't, won't have the same illnesses, you know. I think, personally, you do have to do some experiments on human beings just to, to find out exactly what, what you need to find out. So an Alzheimer's patient with no friends and family, you're okay experimenting on them? Well, I mean, we're only here... Oh. That sounds horrible. Well, we're only here for a short while, right? No, we're only here. Sounds for, great. We're only here for a short while. <laughs> and if we can help each other, you know, we need to help each other. That's, you know, so you need to, to help one another, I guess. And if that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. I mean, you know, it's a dog eat dog world out there. <laughs> or human eat human world out there. You know, however you want to put it, you know. But, you, you know, you, you have to find these things out. We have to find things out. I think the point about that is that you, like, let's just say, another human that we could test on without their consent, because our son patient wouldn't actually be able to give their consent. So as even Bob was saying, oh yeah, we're doing it for the best, they wouldn't be aware of that. They, because they have Alzheimer's, they wouldn't be able to like come to that conclusion, oh yeah, I'm doing this for the best of all people. But, so it's out of their contention. So it would be the same as doing it as if on an animal. I know that seems a little bit harsh, but it's, it goes around, along the same kind of understanding that we do have so if they can't feel it they aren't giving their consent they aren't like consenting to such an act being done on them because they don't have understanding of it same as an animal so would that not be the 
same sort of thing? You know, I sometimes worry about the brutalising effect of my argument. I, I, I disagree because I think if you're saying that it's, it's um, animal, exper animal experimentation is, is okay, okay, and that's fine, but to experiment on humans isn't okay, and then it's okay to experiment on Alzheimer's patients, then that means somehow an Alzheimer's patient has somehow lost the thing that's made them human. And I don't think that's, that's, that's okay, to be honest. I don't think that's acceptable. I don't know if I have any reasons for that, but I just think that's wrong. It's not right um, to experiment on, on human beings in an instrumental fashion without um, their consent. It's not right to experiment on them instrumentally even with their consent, I would argue. I think, Jessica, your argument is not bad, you know, that most people are, have friends and family who care for them and love them and you know, you're doing damage to them, not just to the person you're experimenting on. Unfortunately, that, that argument is vulnerable to the, you know, the homeless, uncared for, unloved um, Alzheimer's patient, and we do have a history of having done some fairly horrible things to those kinds of people in the past. Uh, which is where I think Rob's point comes in. It's like, actually, we, every human being is connected to every other human being through decisions that we've made um, collectively. Um, one of the decisions we made is that we don't treat human beings in an instrumental fashion. You know, it's wrong, um, and we all buy into that. And I would also say that while sentimentality can often be a problem, it's, it's probably okay to be sentimental about our own species as it happens, and it's okay to be sentimental about other things as well, but um, that by the by. And then also, there's a, a practical point here. Um, we're talking about somebody who's descending into dementia. We don't really fully understand that process. We don't know when they are fully demented. We don't know when they've fully lost consciousness. And we don't know if we might find a cure and bring them back. So. Um, for all those reasons, it's a really dangerous idea um, to argue that it's okay to, to um, experiment on people with Alzheimer's. But what Rob said um, about the fact that it's more about humanity as a whole, so that you're part of, but what if a person has excluded themselves from that kind of humanity or cluster that we just live in? So let's say a mass murderer, they've gone and killed everyone, and then we feel as if they don't belong to us anymore. Would they go by that kind of, like, would they be excluded? I know that in China, in prisons, they, I'm not sure if it happened or not, they were thinking of doing experiments on the life or the people who were going to get executed. Yeah. I mean, I just, just quickly on that, um, I don't want to get too hung up on this point. I, I do think that's wrong. And I think it's wrong for a simple reason, that um, it com it's completely anti-human. It, it utterly dehumanises the person, and it gives up any possibility of reform of that human being or of understanding um, what they did. Um, you're basically just casting them out of human society, and like it or not, they are a part of our society. I must say, I, I don't really buy your argument yet with the, that animals really don't experience pain, because it's a hypothesis, and it hasn't really been proven, so to say, as much as science can prove something, but I, I think we don't know whether they do or not, and that's why I think we should treat them with respect, but also, at the same time, we should think of ourselves, of our own species, and we should try and make sure that we can survive for longer. So if we need to do animal experimentation, we should probably do it. Just adding on to that point, if we, we don't know whether or not they can feel or they can't feel, but is it possible to maybe block the neurotransmitters of the animal so we, maybe their nerves don't work, so maybe they're not feeling anything, and then maybe we could test them and uh, observe their physiological state while they are there, but we are, we are aware that they're not feeling any pain. Is that a possibility? Or? Sure, that, that's possible, and lots of experiments are done in that way. But if you want to study um, the noxious nervous system, then you're in trouble if, you, if you're blocking it out. So you rule out an awful lot of experiments on that basis. And I also think that there's still something just quite odd about that argument as well. So again, if you had a human being who was sedated, unconscious, you wouldn't argue, therefore, it's okay to, to do whatever you want to them. Um, just because they don't feel pain doesn't devolve them of, of all moral agency. So it, it doesn't quite work, I don't think, as an argument, but it, it's possible, of course. Okay. Could it be that suffering and pain is like a form, like an expression of higher intelligence? So because we, are, we have more neocortex, because we have more ca capability of thinking things through, that we can experience pain, so if apes became more intelligent, like in the film, um, you know, the new ape film that's apes. come out, so yeah. if they, we gave them a serum that gave them more brain structure, more, they became more intelligent, would they, they would, would they rebel? Would they suddenly feel the pain? Would they suffer? 
I wouldn't tie it to intelligence. It's not really about being intelligent, it's about being conscious, uh, which has got nothing really to do with intelligence at all. That's uh, um, something that human beings are capable of, and all human beings that are acculturated and, and through a particular developmental process will um, become conscious. It, it's not smart, so to speak. Um, but yes, uh, I think your basic point is correct. You know, if, if the apes started um, to feel an experience, then they would start to rebel against it. Experience lends itself to plasticity. Experience lends itself to options. Um, if you experience something, you can decide what to do about it. And if animals experience things, I think they would make different decisions. I don't think chimps would sit in the rain all day um, if they had the option of doing something different. It's not like they're choosing to sit there getting soaked. I don't think dogs would choose to just slink away and sit in the corner if they had other options. They don't have any other option. They behave as they behave because that's the way they're programmed to behave. And they behave in that way um, indicates they don't have any experience behind um, what is happening. I really want to believe, and it's so logical and it makes so much sense. Mm. Um, the only thing I, the only reason I'm not completely convinced is that you're such a minority. I don't understand, given how much research is going into it. Um, I mean, number one, there's so much research. Is that because we still have so many unanswered questions? And number, like, how can you be so convinced that you're right? And if you are right, why isn't everybody else following what you're saying? Because it makes life a lot easier. <laughs> well, <laughs> fabulous place. If you know, every time a right <laughs> opinion came along, everybody just fell in line with it. It doesn't work like that. And I'm not saying that I've got it right in every single nuance. Um, I don't. I think this is up for argument and this is up for debate. I think the reason why it's not a popular argument is fairly obvious. Nobody wants to think of their um, animals as, as automatons. You know, it's just not how we do things. We do anthropomorphize, we do embody, give them intentionality and think of them as, you know, experiencing feeling creatures. But scientists should know better. You're right, <laughs> but, you know, they don't. Can I, isn't that a new thing, though, the idea that in Western society we anthropomorphize more than perhaps we did or other cultures do? You know, there's a larger proportion of vegetarians, I think, in the West than there are in other countries. Um, so isn't there that aspect to it as well, but, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It goes hand in hand with the stuff that came up earlier about the dehumanisation of um, human beings, you know, the animalisation of human beings and the humanisation of animals. That's a fairly modern phenomenon. It's not just down to Disney, but it didn't help. You know, there's lots of um, <laughs> reasons why we think less of ourselves and think more of animals, and that, yeah, that plays into it. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you, Stuart, for sharing your ideas and for the lovely discussion. If you'd like to become part of our science project or take part in another episode of Don't Shout at the Telly, please email us at Worldwides. And do let us know what you think by leaving a comment below.